Okay, great. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so just resuming, I um, want to introduce some of the um, research network leadership. So Dr. Shiri Eisencott, she's a professor and the director of XR, the XR Access Initiative, and she's also a co-founder. Uh, she's a professor at Cornell Tech. Um, Ricardo Gonzalez, PhD student in information science, and myself, Nyla Wilson-Small, I'm also a PhD student. Um, we uh, work with Shiri Eisencott at Cornell Tech. So XR Access, we are a community that engages, connects, and influences the field of XR, XR being virtual and augmented reality. And our mission is to build and share knowledge, skills, tools, and user experiences leading to practices to make XR inclusive of all regardless of abilities. And so the research network specifically, we focus on celebrating and sharing academic research with the goal of making XR technologies accessible through seminars such as this and open discussions. And we're very excited to introduce our speaker today, Dr. John Quarles, who is a professor at the University of Texas, San Antonio in the computer science department. And his talk today will be on making virtual reality more accessible for persons with balance impairments. And so the way we'll do this is if you have any questions, um, you can post them in the Zoom chat. Myself, I'll be monitoring them and then we'll be able to ask at the end. Um, and also I just want to post one announcement. If you guys attended the XR Access Symposium, then we will, um, we'd like for you to fill out the exit survey. If you haven't done that already, the form will be closing soon. So I think we're gonna go ahead and, yes, thank you, Dylan, who's just posted that in the chat. So if you haven't filled out the exit survey yet, we would love for you to do that so we can get feedback and understand how we can improve the experience next year. And with that, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Yay. All right, uh, so yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm, I'm John Quarles um, from the University of Texas at San Antonio, and I'm gonna talk about um, why virtual reality is pretty inaccessible and <laughs> what it is that we can do. Some of the things that we can do to help it be a little more accessible, especially with people with balance impairments. So I first wanna kind of start out and give you a little background on myself, just to give you my perspective uh, on this whole problem. Um, so I, I have multiple sclerosis, which means that sometimes I'm in a wheelchair, sometimes I'm not in a wheelchair. Um, it, my balance is generally disrupted by things. Um, I'm in Texas and it's super hot here. So if I go outside, it messes up all of my walking and uh, basically everything because of the heat is known to that's a pretty common issue when it comes to uh, people with multiple sclerosis that he, he affects them. Um, <clears throat> this is my lab. I mean, this is the picture you see there is my lab. And uh, it's really messy. We do a lot of work in there and we don't really clean up after ourselves very well. Uh, but, you know, they say like creative people are messy. But, you know, it's I guess that's probably a, that's probably just a it's probably an excuse because you can see my face. If you look at my background, it's also pretty messy, but I'm not really ashamed of it. Honestly, I'm kind of proud of having such a messy place because it looks like we do stuff in there because we do. Um, yeah, so a lot of the things that I have been working on over the past uh, number of years, just been interested in over the past, I don't know, 15 years or so, uh, has been largely about trying to make virtual reality uh, more accessible or uh, more effective for more accessible for people with disabilities, more effective for rehabilitation. Well, those those are really two different things, though. And today I'm going to talk about the accessibility part of recently what we've been working on. But before I do that, I'm going to give you a little more perspective of where I'm coming from and why it is that we decided that my research group decided to go in this direction originally and, uh, and, and how we got there. Uh, Oh, right. So the last 20 years, I died. I almost died a bunch of times. 
so I'm pretty used to that. Uh, I got married, had a couple of kids, and all of these things, of course, are uh, more annoying when it, when you have uh, balance impairments. Um, right now, I used to not have balance impairments. Back when I graduated from high school, I was in cross country, and I was in a uh, I was in a, a pop rock band. I was in the cool band in our high school <laughs> and uh that was me at one of our gigs um so yeah i didn't really have any mobility impairments back then i didn't i wasn't born with uh multiple sclerosis or mobility impairments that really didn't come along until a little bit later uh, and before that there's a bunch of other things like drawing comic books and video games there so i've always been interested in video game related stuff uh, actually, in 2003, I was interviewing for, I think I decided, I decided to go to grad school. My dad was a, a physics professor um, at TCU, and so I was kind of familiar with what is it, what's it like to, you know, uh, to be a professor, and I thought that made it sound like a pretty cool gig, and uh, of course, I didn't go into that, because so I was always very much a gamer when I was growing up. So I didn't go into physics. I went into something that seemed more game-like, which uh, virtual reality was the coolest thing that I'd ever seen at the time. And actually one of the neatest experiences I had, this is, again, this is before I had any balance impairments. One of the neatest, like most immersive experiences I ever, uh, and one of my first introductions in the VR was this pit experiment. And this experiment is where you, you walk out, I mean, you're literally walking and you walk out, real walking, and you walk out on this ledge and you look over in this particular iteration, I think you're dropping little balls on those, uh, those targets just so that you know, they can enforce that you look over the edge. And I remember when I was interviewing for my, for graduate schools and my soon to be advisor was like, okay, and I was doing this. He was like, okay, watch this. And I was like, whoa, like, you know, like it definitely disrupted my balance while I was doing this. And Everybody thought it was hilarious, and I thought it was awesome uh, because there was no pit. <laughs> it just appeared that there was, and that in itself, you know, made my body react like a pit, like I was over a pit. So it was very, it was a very strong illusion. And I thought, well, that's really what I want to do. I want to, I want to make people feel like they're falling in a pit uh, for the rest of my life. So that, that's kind of what I started doing. I actually did. We actually did quite a few studies on that, but I'm not going to talk about those today. Uh, somewhere around 2004, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Actually, the first issue that I had with multiple sclerosis was uh, optic neuritis, and that's where your immune system attacks the myelin on your neurons that are on your optic nerve. And so I had some weird stuff going on. I woke up and I had some weird stuff going on in one of my eyes, and it looked kind of foggy, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. And you don't mess around when you have eye stuff going on, so... Uh, I went into the doctor and they diagnosed me with multiple sclerosis after an MRI. And my sister also has multiple sclerosis. So that actually helped me get diagnosed faster. And she has a lot of the same, a lot of the, not exactly the same problems, but a lot of the same problems, largely with mobility. Um, I had a bunch of other issues in terms of my first issues were, were eye issues, but those kind of went away after a while. Um, I, mean, I had some other eye issues, but uh, those kind of went away after a while. It pretty much became all mobility issues eventually, but we'll get to that. Which in grad school, I didn't have a whole lot of problems really. I had already been diagnosed. I had some eye problems, but it didn't really impede my vision all that much or just my ability to do things in graduate school. Uh, I made, a, I did my PhD around building an augmented reality or mixed reality application for uh, helping anesthesiologists uh, learn to basically fix their anesthesia machine when something goes wrong. Uh, so that was a fun project. Um, but in 2009, when I graduated, there's a lot of things that happened that year. I, uh, due to the uh, online stalking efforts of my wife, we were able to get backstage, uh, because she corrected his grammar, we were able to get backstage passes to uh, Nine Inch Nails and I met my music hero, uh, Trent Reznor, and he was actually a really nice guy. They say not to meet your heroes, but he was actually really cool. Um, so that was that was pretty cool. It doesn't really have anything to do with anything else, except other things that was happening in 2009. I also joined uh, UTSA at that time as an assistant professor, 
And shortly thereafter, starting at UTSA, I had a massive multiple sclerosis attack and uh, really the first really big one I had, I think. And so I was very quickly not able to, uh, I was very getting very fatigued when I was walking around having a lot of balance problems, much more affected by heat, uh, having to use a, a cane or a walker or something like that. I hadn't quite gotten to the wheelchair point yet, but that comes later. Um, yeah, so I had a big multiple sclerosis attack in 2009, and, and I would, if you can avoid having a multiple sclerosis attack, when you start as an assistant professor, I would generally suggest trying to avoid that, <laughs> if at all possible, because you have enough things to worry about when you're an assistant professor. Um, but yeah, so the, in summary, before I had an MS attack, I could use VR and pretty well, as much as well as anybody else. Well, I mean, I guess. I don't think I've ever been a particularly... Uh, hand-eye coordination, hand-eye coordinated type of person. Uh, so, but I could, you know, I could play around in VR and have fun in it. And I could use it, it was accessible to me at the time. Whereas after the MS attack, yeah, if I put a head mount on, uh, I would pretty much fall over. Like I could not maintain my balance in VR, barely at all. I had to have like either people hold on to me or hold on to something and even then, like I would get a lot more fatigued even in VR because my muscles, I think maybe weren't used to reacting that way. Um, yeah, so that that kind of made me think, gee, there's gotta be, there gotta be something I can do to fix this problem for other people that have uh, balance impairments. So I got together with my, my, my PhD students and we did a whole bunch of research. Um, and uh, published it at some, some fun places to publish at. And uh, more recently, we finally came around to actually addressing this problem rather than trying to understand why it was happening. Um, and we're actually going, I mean, we're doing this and we're continuing with this, but currently we're gonna largely talk about how we address the balance problem in VR with audio. Like we're just changing things about the audio. So let's talk a little bit about balance problems in VR in general. And as we all know, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, uh, mixed reality is becoming a lot more popular. Um, maybe not as popular as we'd like it to yet, but we're all hopeful that it will get there. Um, so there's lots more people that, uh, it's also become more affordable. Um, so it's, but still, I'd say still, it's not super affordable. Uh, it needs to get more, more affordable. But still, it's basically, there's a lot more people using it. A lot more people that can try it out. And uh, the really annoying thing is if you have balance impairments and you try it out, then and it messes with your balance, then maybe you, you give it up at that point. You're like, well, I, this is not accessible to me. I can't, I'm, I'm not going to continue doing this. Or it makes you sick or something like that, right? So... Um, we're trying to prevent things like that from happening so everybody can, um, everybody can, really everybody can have better balance in VR. Because it turns out that um, VR in general causes imbalance for everybody, regardless of whether or not you have balance impairments. Um, if you have balance impairments, it's much worse. We have, I mean, it's, it's a much more, uh, it's a much more pronounced effect. And it's much harder to uh, adapt to, I think imbalance in VR if you have other balance impairments already. So uh, really we want to make, the goal of course is, um, and, and what I'm gonna talk about today is, well, what can we, what are some simple things that we can do to improve balance in VR? With in this case, it's just audio feedback. Uh, so we're, we're looking at other modalities currently, but right now, what I'm going to talk about today is just using audio feedback. And a lot of this stuff is actually inspired by um, assistive technology research that's been done for the real world. And we were curious as to whether it would actually work in the, in the virtual world, because what's causing your imbalance in the virtual world is a little bit different than what is causing your imbalance in the real world. It's harder to adapt to. So uh, we wanted to see if, if those kind of approaches still work. And of course, our overall purpose is generally to make you know, immersive virtual reality more accessible in this particular work. We're really, what we're doing in this is it's really, I mean, I'm generally interested in doing VR and AR and the whole spectrum of XR. 
Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today is really just VR. Um, as I said, there's been lots of research that has confirmed that there's an imbalance effect for everybody, but um, there's not really been a lot that has been done to really try to reduce this. Um, and actually, if you look into the cyber sickness research, which is another line of research that I am interested in and have been working in, uh, and my, my students are making lots of progress in, uh, there, is, there is some link between, there's thought to be some link between uh, postural stability and cyber sickness. Uh, so we're not exactly sure how to tease that out, to separate that out really, but uh, to, yeah, because I mean, we can, as I'll demonstrate in a minute, we can, we can people can be off balance in, uh, in, our, in our virtual environments without being severely cyber sick. But I suspect there's some interplay between those kind of issues. Um, but more work on that is needed. Uh, most of the previous work on balance, uh, imbalance in VR is done with, on people without disabilities. So there's really only so much that we can conclude about it in terms of the more general wider population of uh, including people with disabilities and especially balance impairments. Um, there has been quite a bit of rehabilitative work in VR. Uh, I'd say that most of them, at least for the balance uh, related VR work, balance rehabilitation kind of work, doesn't really use head mounted displays. And I, I don't think that they say it's for this reason, but it is probably for this reason. Most of the ones that I've seen that are using gate or balance or something like that, everybody's always hanging on to something. Uh, so you can't, it's, it's particularly hard for, especially for certain kinds of, uh, certain kinds of, of disabilities, you know, for example, balance impairments that are caused by neurological problems, um, where part of the issue is that if I close my eyes, I can't tell where my self is in space, really. Uh, it's the same reason why I have to drive with a, um, with a, uh, uh, with a hand controls, because I can't, if I can't see what my feet are doing, then, I, then it's going to cause trouble for me to put them in the right place or maintain my balance. Um, uh, in terms of this, there actually has been a fair amount of work in using auditory feedback, like I said, in, uh, in, in the real world for just improving balance in the real world. And so, uh, and that includes spatial audio. I'll talk about what these are in a little bit. Spatial audio, center of pressure, which is really more of a measure of your balance. Um, and, but it's based upon the audio feedback based upon your center of pressure. And then there's also just rhythmic, where it just plays a rhythm. Uh, and then sometimes you can do it with just white noise, but we'll, we'll talk about these in a little more detail in a minute. But they do seem to work in some cases for some people in the real world. Um, so as I said, we're looking at several different kinds of auditory techniques, and I'll explain those a little bit more in detail. Uh, but basically there's two different tasks we're looking at. Uh, there's standing balance, and that's really just you're standing on a balance uh, a balance board, which is measuring your balance. And I mean, it doesn't, put, the board itself doesn't put you out of balance. I'll show you a picture in a minute. And you're looking around and then another one where you're reaching and grasping. So these are very, I would say, one of the limitations of this work is that the tasks that we're having people do, these are very much laboratory controlled tasks. So take the results with a grain of salt because uh, if you really did this, if you really tried to apply this and say Beat Saber or something, I'm not, I'm not sure how well it would work yet. That's actually something else we're interested in doing in the future. Um, basically, we took tasks and uh, real ta real kind of balance type of tasks and uh, largely um, you know, uh, balance tasks that you would normally assess in a kinesiology kind of uh, perspective and then uh, implemented in the VR to test the VR uh, feedback, audio feedback. We had 42 participants, 21 of which had balance impairments uh, due to multiple sclerosis, and 21 which didn't have uh, balance impairments. Uh, and they were all, uh, we did have, we did have a somewhat unbalanced set of participants in terms of gender. Uh, we had more females than males. The reason why that ended up happening is because that is a more representative population, a uh, representative sample of multiple sclerosis 
because in general, people, more people that are female have multiple sclerosis than people that are male. Um, so this is actually somewhat representative of uh, the, the MS population. But uh, we tried to keep the, between the two populations, the for people with balanced impairments and people without balanced impairments, we tried to keep uh, things like age, height, and weight in a relatively close range, uh, or at least in the same, across the same range in both groups. Uh, so we weren't exactly doing like matched participant to participant, but the groups themselves and their uh, the age, height, and weight were matched, which according to our uh, kinesiology collaborators seem to be uh, the, major, ma the, the major variables that would affect your balance. So let's talk a little bit more about the study conditions. Of course, we had a baseline where we had people do a standing balance task and a reach and grab task, just in reality, because we just wanted to see what their baseline was. And there are several VR conditions. One, there was spatial audio. So basically what we did in this case was we put a sound source, a virtual sound source completely simulated somewhere in the virtual room, which was actually, I think it was about like a little bit in front of you and to the, the left um, and maybe on the, on the floor. Um, but basically this is, this is simulated, it's the, it was a white noise sound, it was simulated audio. So of course, when I turn my, if it's right in front of me and I turn my head to the right, then I'm gonna hear it more on my left. And if I turn my head to the left, I'm gonna hear it more on my right. So basically the uh, uh, you know, typical 3D audio way of, of, of uh, in VR with headphones. We also had a stack rest frame and this was literally just white noise played in headphones so there's no, nothing spatial about this. It was, I think it was even mono. Um, and of course, the, the, the reasoning for that was uh, there is something called stochastic resonance in the literature of, you know, ways of, you can, ways of providing audio to improve people's balance. And just playing white noise for people is one of those. And we'll talk about a little bit of discussion as to why that may work. And there's also rhythmic audio. That's really where we took the white noise and we just played it, you know, like psh, 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 every second. And there was center of pressure path audio. And the center of pressure path is basically derived from the data that we're taking from a balance board, which is really gives you an X and a Y and, you know, how far. And, and they use a pressure sensor, force sensors on the balance board. Uh, and it, it, it looks to see how far you're leaning uh, over time. Uh, and based upon that, if we had, uh, if you were you know, like more towards, leaning more towards the front, then uh, the pitch would change. So it'd be like, or if you're leaning more towards the back, leaning more towards the back, it'd be like kind of thing. And then the, the stereo, uh, the stereo pan would change based upon your uh, left and right leaning. And then of course we did one with no audio feedback whatsoever. Um, so there's a, th this is kind of how our, our environments look like. There's a real environment, virtual environment. And actually this first task, it's a really simple task. You're honestly not even really moving your body. We really just have people in a very controlled fashion look at different things. So we call it visual exploration it really just slightly imbalances you. Um, but it is, I think it was, it was kind of inspired by, you know, the, the use case where you're, you're basically just looking around in VR and standing there. There are quite a few applications that, that do things like that, but maybe simpler than that even. So we won't really wanted to control it. Uh, so the computer would basically just tell you, look left, look top, look bottom, look right, front, and then you would do that. Participants would do that. And then we would measure their balance as they were doing that. Um, this is the reach and grasp task. So we have to do it in reality. And we also have to do it in virtual reality in a very similar way. But basically you stood with your feet flat on the balance board uh, and you just reached out and grabbed virtual objects or real objects in the case of the real world and picked them up and dropped them. But of course the idea was that you kept your feet on the board. You're not supposed to like lean so far over that you're gonna be falling off the board. Uh, and in all of these types of tasks, we had people on a harness just in case, uh, just in case they were they 
they were in danger of falling. But luckily we didn't have anybody. So luckily we didn't have anybody get hurt in this. Uh, the study procedure, yes. So um, of course we had, you know, th there were, everything was counter about the, the tasks were, uh, the audit tasks and auditory feedback were counterbalanced. Um, Participants, especially since you know a lot of our MS participants had issues with fatigue, because that's a, a symptom of, of MS. Basically, they were allowed to rest as long as they needed to between trials. Um, overall, the study on average took about two hours to complete. Uh, and of course, we had IRB approval to do all of this stuff, and everybody uh, that was involved in it, and all the participants were aware of what it meant to be a participant. And uh, um, they there was this was actually. This was actually conducted during really the height of COVID. Uh, so we had to take a lot of extra precautions and uh, taking people's temperature and things as they were coming in the door. Uh, and we asked them several other things about handedness and uh, also looked at an activity's specific balance, confidence skills, kind of how confident are you in your uh, ability to balance during everyday activities. Um, and we also asked things about simulator sickness and some demographic stuff. This main metrics that we want to talk about, center of pressure velocity. Again, this is a, this is a pretty popular me metric for measuring balance. Uh, and as I said, you, you kind of take the X and Y of the, of the uh, you, you take the X and Y of your balance board, and then you can compute the, in the paper. I'll show you, I'll give you a link to the paper. There's a, there's a, there's a, an equation that shows you how to do it, but it's basically kind of like the speed of change of your, center of pressure, so where you're leaning, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. Uh, there's also, we also gave them the activity, the ABC scale, which again, we're just trying to make sure that the, the participants in both of the groups uh, had an awareness of what, or to report, it was a self-report as to what they thought their balance was. Um, and just, just in case we were concerned if simulator sickness was going to cause problems with balance, which you know very well could, we decided to measure this just to, just to make sure and to see what kind of an impact it had. Um, so with our data, first we did a Shapiro Wilk test to figure out what things were and everything was normal. Uh, we did a two by six mixed model ANOVA to find any significant differences and COP velocity was really our main metric of balance. So that's mostly what we're gonna be talking about. Again, we had, uh, we were comparing people with balance impairments to people without balance impairments. And we were comparing people with balance impairments to themselves across the different conditions and people without balance impairments to themselves across the different conditions. Um, and we did T-tests, we followed this up with T-tests with von Fronin correction to, to do uh, multiple, uh, to deal with multiple comparisons. Um, yeah, so there's actually one, I think one of the biggest surprises in this was that, uh, and every time I think about it, I'm like, I don't understand why that works, but I have some ideas. Uh, yeah, it turned out that basically any audio feedback that we gave them in this was helpful. Even just the, it was helpful more so than nothing. Even just the static, even if we just give them white noise, which actually there has been some other literature that has shown if you give people white noise, it improves their, uh, it improves their, uh, or it reduces their cyber sickness as well. So there might be some link there, right? Um, overall, we found that uh, for the standing visual exploration task, uh, the center of pressure audio feedback and the spatial audio feedback, those were not really significantly different from each other, um, but, they were better than everything else. Um, any feedback is better than no feedback. Uh, and it turned out that a lot of these feedbacks actually made, were, were better than, uh, 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 were, were, were at least marginally better than just having your everyday real life feedback, which was also interesting. Uh, and the other surprising thing actually was that this also, all of these things also helped people without balance impairments, um, which we didn't think it was going to help them as much, but it, it, it was a significant difference. I think overall it did, from an effect size perspective, it did help people with balance impairments more than people without balance impairments, but it was encouraging that 
these kind of approaches, audio, just audio-based approaches does seem to help uh, help you with your balance, regardless of whether or not you have knowledge impairments or not. And basically it was pretty much the same result in a standing reach and grasp task. Even though you're doing something slightly different because you're reaching out and grabbing things. Uh, and some of these were a little bit more pronounced in this class in this in this case because uh, probably because the task itself was a little more imbalancing than the, the visual exploration task. But still, it's basically the same things that we found as, that, were, that we found in the other task were significant in the standing reach and grab task. So still you've got your COP and your, your, your center of pressure and your spatial uh, audio feedback tended to be the best. Didn't really see a difference between them uh, significantly anyway. Um, but they seem to be better than the, the rhythmic and the static, and all of those were better than <clears throat> um, having no feedback at all. So let's talk a little bit more about why we think we might have seen results like this. Um, uh, it's not unreasonable. Uh, it's kind of intuitive to think, well, the auditory feedback that actually gave you, that was synced to your change in position. So this is this is the audio, the spatial audio, and this is the center, of the audio based upon the center of pressure. So that makes sense. I mean, you're getting a little bit more information than you would get with uh, just plain static white noise or rhythmic static white noise that's that's not uh, synced to your position or your orientation, right? So that makes sense. That that, that that's not totally surprising as to why we saw that. Um, one thing to remember about this is this particular virtual environment that we use, it really didn't have anything else moving in it. Uh, and it was besides the user themselves and, you know, and occasionally when they're picking things up and dropping them. Um, and it was a replication of our actual lab. Okay. That could, so that's a potential limitation, but we, but the reason that we did that is because we really wanted to make sure that we could actually compare to their real baseline in a fair way. Um, so they had pretty much the same kind of, at least visual uh, uh, visual feedback based upon, you know, from the, that they got from the real environment. That could, have had a, that could have had an effect on the results, I think. And there's some more things that we plan to do in the, in the future that's gonna look at different kinds of environments. Um, People got a little bit cyber sickness, but I, a little bit of cyber sickness, but it was not really significant, uh, more so than what you would expect them to get just in any kind of being in VR for a little bit. Uh, it was on the low. So if, if you think about cyber sickness in terms of you know, the simulated sickness questionnaire and you ultimately get kind of a, um, you, can, you can classify it as low, moderate, like none, low, moderate, severe. Basically, everybody had, they got cyber sickness. It was low cyber sickness. So in this case, yeah, it's possible that there is some uh, connection between uh, or some correlation between uh, 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 between your, your balance and cyber sickness. But in this case, it was not a significant correlation. Um, so what can we take away from this? Um, so yeah, the spatial and the center of pressure types of feedback that give you more information about your position were better. Uh, kind of makes sense because I mean a lot a lot of the times um, the processing it takes I mean you, the processing the time it takes to process or just to visualize things in v, in in VR you've at least got twenty to fifty milliseconds of latency which sounds like not very much and that's just one potential reason. There's a lot of others that if you dig into our previous work, you can find. Um, but just to give you an example, yeah, there is a little bit of latency, which is not what you're used to in real in the real world, because you don't really have that latency in the real world. It's a little more difficult to adjust to. Um, why? Interestingly, though, the, the rhythmic and the stack rest frame stuff, it's just the white noise, it still works, still improves it. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why that is. I think Coming from a cyber sickness kind of perspective and thinking about uh, different um, uh, uh, different modalities of, or different senses conflicting with each other, a lot of the times you're in VR is thought that one of the, is theorized that one of the reasons that uh, you get cyber sick or 
in, in virtual reality is because your, uh, your vestibular sense is not really getting the same information as your visual sense. Or at least the, what you're getting from your visual sense is more latent, right? Or what you're or not, what you're not as predictable as the real world. Um, so it may be that giving this additional static, this additional adding this additional noise to the system makes you pay attention, kind of solves that. This is really a hypothesis, okay? But it kind of helps your sensory system to solve, to decide one or the other is adding that additional noise it makes one of the makes your your body think well maybe my vestibular system this is maybe it's disrupt maybe the noise is disrupting my vestibular system and making it less reliable for my brain so it pays more attention to the the uh to the to the, the visuals i don't know there's more research that needs to be done in that uh, but i think it's an interesting topic um Generally, spatial audio, audio feedback, I mean, one of the nice things about this is that we pretty much put spatial auditory feedback in pretty much all virtual reality games. So that's better than nothing, for sure. Uh, it still remains to be seen uh, whether or not uh, adding stat, you know, white noise, like additional white noise or something like that, some sort of recognizable sound on top of all the other spatial audio that you get in VR, whether that really works, but that's something that we're interested in doing in the future. Um, but yeah, really the whole idea is here, that we want to better understand how we can use auditory feedback to improve balance. And uh, overall have, you know, help developers to think about way, simple ways that they can introduce feedback into their, uh, into their environments and their their games and experiences that will help it be help their help it become more accessible for people with balance impairments. Uh, in the future, yes, we are actually current. We are have we have looked at also other uh, audio um, other tasks um, using audio. We've also looked at we're also currently looking at other modalities like vibrotactile uh, feedback. And as I said, I'm interested in looking at these were these, these experiments that we ran were quite a bit. They're very much laboratory experiments, very controlled. And it would be interesting to see how well these uh, these approaches work in a much more busy, like put it in Beat Saber and see if it works. Uh, we're literally talking about potentially doing that. I don't know. <laughs> we're going to do it eventually. I'm not sure if it's in, in, in the next few months or not yet. Um, and we're also looking at other kinds of tasks. So uh, this was a, these were standing balance tasks. We're also looking at uh, these types of feedback and how they affect your gait or walking patterns in VR. So just to sum up, the most of the things I talked about today were actually in a paper that we presented at IEEE VR this last uh, March. So if you're interested in more details, uh, you can look that up. Um, and uh, you can always contact me if there are uh, anybody that is interested that is looking to do a PhD, come and apply to our PhD program. Uh, I've got all my stuff is currently funded by NSF and I'm looking for other people. Well, not that's not my only funding, but I am looking to fill some slots uh, for people that are interested and uh, motivated in making VR more accessible. Uh, Anyways, with that, I'll open it up to questions. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, if anyone have, has questions, you can put them in the chat and I can relay them. We did have a comment in the chat from Haley discussing division vestibular information conflict problem when you were discussing your hypothesis about why even just the white noise um, was able to improve balance. So I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah, I think that's something that we need to study a little bit more. I think when I was when I was originally uh, thinking about this, I'm just reading originally reading some papers about this idea of stochastic resonance where uh, you can just play audio like white noise for people and it will improve their balance. 
it's weird i don't i don't quite understand why it works um uh and i don't know how practical that is really i also the other the other question that that we haven't addressed in this is um i don't i don't think i mentioned it but basically all of the intensities of the, like the volume of the audio that we put into this this they were all just calibrated to the user that is we just let the user set it at each participant set it at a comfortable volume for them we just said okay set the volume at a comfortable volume right but uh I don't know what the answer is. If what if we reduced the like what if we reduced it so it wasn't quite as obvious? Because one one of the issues that I have with a lot of this stuff is, well, if you're putting weird white noise into your environment, uh, that could you know disrupt presence, which is kind of the point of virtual reality in a lot of ways. I mean, I think uh, you know if 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 that was if a little bit of white noise was a difference between me be able, me to be able to play a VR game and I wasn't able to play. Then I'd probably accept it, but again, it's not like it's not the end all perfect perfect solution. Right. I think that actually leads well into Dylan's question. Uh, very awesome presentation. Very curious about how implementing this for different apps would look. Example, Beat Saber versus Alt Space right. VR versus Super Hot. Now, what I would like to do, uh, and I think we need to do some more research with this and and more, uh, you know let's say ecologically valid uh, uh, um, settings like you know, actual games that people are playing, right? Uh, so that is something on our, on our roadmap to do. Um, but, uh, and I don't know exactly what the, I think it, it may, I, I can imagine if we literally stick with the white noise business, then and people can still hear it. It will probably still help, but maybe not. My, my thought is it probably won't help as much because there's just a lot of other um, there's just a lot of other things going on in the environments, right? Which are going to distract you. Uh, and these environments, the tasks themselves are rather focused, right? So that 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 could have had a, you know a, a stronger effect. But in terms of implementation, uh, you know, there was a paper, uh, not I think it was I can't remember. It was a few years ago that where they developed. Um, a vision toolkit, like for low vision, and uh, they did. They actually developed it as part of Steam VR, if I if I remember correctly. So you could basically use it in any game that implements Steam VR. That's pro from an implementation point. That's probably the direction that we would go with it. Uh, let's see. Yes. Tried, if you tried to see whether simply playing non-spatialized music in VR environment has a similar effect to non-spatialized white noise, uh, we've not. But again, like that's one of those things. Like we kind of started with people ask us, like, why don't you use white noise in this? That doesn't seem like who would ever want to use white noise. And the reason why is because it came from the uh, it came from the assistive technology literature that was using it for not VR. So we thought, well, we wanted to be at least, you know. Uh, at least somewhat comparable to to that, right? Um, but no, I think that's actually a really good point. If you just put music in, and my bet is that it would work because if you take the uh, if you take the the rhythmic audio, for example, I mean, we've been talking about like just just white noise, but the rhythmic white noise where it's psh, 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 kind of stuff. If you give people a rhythm, there's actually quite a bit of uh, research that, um, for example, for people with Parkinson's. That have this gate freezing issue where like when you walk through a doorway basically your your your, your legs essentially stop and you don't really have control over it but there has been some uh there has been some assistive technology created for i mean it's very simple assistive technology it's really just playing a beat like playing a, a rhythm in your ear and i think that you can do the same thing with uh i believe you can do the same thing with music but i haven't tried it that that would be kind of interesting. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing is there's a lot of things that are already in VR that could actually be helping with, they're probably not sufficient to help with everybody's uh, everybody's balance. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that might be another reason why you need to put music into your games. <laughs> uh, or, or music with beat in it, not just ambient music. Uh, Right, there is a walk-in VR driver. Yeah, that's another example of that. Right. Uh, uh, John, I have, have a question. 
they have a lot of other things. Oh yeah, oh, hey, sure, yeah. Question. Hi, yeah, great talk, thank you. Um, sure. I'm wondering, so like you were saying, there's a lot going on with MS and you were really looking at balance impairments here. Like, are you considering other the other sort of complexities that go along with that that might affect people's ability to use VR and and also AR? Yeah, so actually one of the things that we're not, I mean, one of the things that we're just now starting up is we're going to look at um, people that have balance and that have not necessarily as pronounced balance impairments as say people with MS, but uh, if you take an older population um, where it, that, that has a little bit more balance impairments and see if age really makes a difference there, uh, they, the, the older population doesn't necessarily have specific balance impairments because, uh, because of age, just generally your balance is not quite as good a lot of the time. That is something that we're looking at. But again, it's kind of like we really got to spend some time looking at other populations to really make conclusions about things outside the mess. Uh, does that answer your question? But do you yeah. think even for older adults, like it seems like there's a lot more going on typically than just um, no, you're right. With balance, that, right. That's a problem, you know, uh, and that is a limitation of this is that um, I mean, generally with the, the people with we, we generally try to recruit of these specific populations, we generally try to recruit a relatively homogeneous set of them because there is quite a spectrum of, of ability. Um, just so that we can kind of isolate some of that out mm -hmm. but i mean they that, that's another that's another point that everybody with ms they say everybody kind of has their own version of it <laughs> and this is true with most disabilities honestly yeah. uh, what i would like to see this is a little bit more forward thinking and maybe um a little bit more in tune with uh what we're doing with uh what we're doing with cyber sickness in my lab right now, where we're using uh, we're using things like deep learning to predict uh, whether you're going to get cyber sickness or not in advance, but basically personalizing that, right? So what I would like to see is a more adaptive solution to the individual. Um, but still, like from a science perspective, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you, there are a lot of things, and we would try to uh, keep those as, as the same as we can, but there's only so much you can do. Uh, without having like everybody in the world do your study. All right, other questions? Oh, I've got one. <laughs> sure. Um, so this is just, it was super interesting that you guys found an effect with spatial audio um, because really spatial audio right now, especially with just generalized HRTFs, they're really crude approximations, right. kind of like you were saying, where you can, you can get like left, right sensations, but a lot of other like true spatial sounds you experience reality aren't there, but you guys right. did find an effect. So I'm just kind of curious, um, how would you see your own research, particularly on like, for example, on balance evolving if or when spatial audio becomes more accurate? Because if it works this well now, that's kind of nice. Well, yeah, I mean, so my initial thought to that is, and I'm not, I mean, we're doing, I'm not an audiologist, right? <laughs> we're doing some work with VR, but, but uh, so, but my initial thought on that is, is that um, I kind of wonder, and I don't know the answer to this, but I kind of wonder uh, how good does it, I mean, how accurate does it need to be? It might even be, you might even be able to get away with it being less accurate. Um, because just basically the human ability to localize sound is actually not that great, like compared to say vision, right? Localizing things with vision, which is really good. Uh, so I kind of wonder if we, if we made it worse, <laughs> if it wouldn't actually have a similar effect, if not, if, you know, uh, if we made it better, I think, yeah, I mean, if we really, really, uh, did a really realistic, uh, uh, a really realistic version of it. I, I don't know. I don't know how much better you could really get it. And it would probably very much depend upon the environment that you were trying to, uh, you know, you were trying to simulate. I mean, 
if we put this thing into like an echo chamber, right? Or if we <laughs> if we simulated a bunch of delay in there, and, you know, reverb and stuff, then yeah, it's a lot harder to localize, which you actually get in, uh, you know, you get more of potentially in the real world, depending upon what your room looks like, right? So I, I mean, I think that's an interesting question. I don't know what the answer is to it yet, though. Uh, but I would bet that it's not going to be as pronounced as you would like it to be in That's terms of fair. effective balance. I think you're right. Also, it's probably also problem specific, like you were saying with like localizing right. objects in space. Right. Um, I think with rare exceptions, um, like people who prolonged vision loss, um, mo most uh, users are of VR are probably not very good at it. Um, one other follow up quick question okay. is, um, uh, you mentioned um, extending, trying to extend this work maybe to augmented reality for balance improvement. Do you mm. personally experience balance issues or do you know of like people with balance problems experiencing balance issues in AR? Not in AR really, no. I'd say, it, actually, I'm going to say that's not necessarily true. It depends on the AR. If I do a video see-through kind of AR, then yeah, I probably would. Uh, not, not so much as uh, VR. Okay, but if I put my my quest on and I can see the real world, yeah, I still have some balance impairments. Uh, there's still some latency there. It's still messing, the resolution is still messing with you uh, and things don't look the same way exactly as you would expect. However, if I put a HoloLens on, then I have no problem at all. Now, if you put, uh, if you put, now the case with augmented reality, most of what you're seeing is the real world, right? So if you took virtual objects and just, used a, head, uh, a put them all over your HoloLens environment and that's all you saw, then yes, that would mess with my balance. And actually I've had that experience before. Uh, but under, under most cases, like you have a few objects, right? And, and uh, I mean, that, that's the other thing is like there, I think that there is potentially a link between cyber signals also because I don't get cyber signal HoloLens either. I've never gotten cyber signal HoloLens no matter what I, well, that's not true. If, again, if you put like, virtual objects all over your environment and that's pretty much all you see and yeah i'll get a little bit sick potentially but if i see mostly the real world and there's like zero latency between my eyes and the real world then yeah i don't really have too many balance impairments i don't really have uh, uh i don't really I, I think it's more accessible for me in that in that case uh, anyways yeah that's a good question all right thanks everybody i appreciate it uh, appreciate all your questions. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is this is a great thing. Uh, the XR Access program is great. Everybody needs to stay involved in it. I know I, I should be more involved in it than I am. <laughs> really, I've met you. Uh, you know, just I'll me. follow up with an email about that, John. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank right. you so much. This was a great talk. You guys have also been a great audience. Just a couple more Housekeeper reminders, again, if you attended the symposium and you haven't filled out the exit survey yet, I'm gonna repost that in the chat again very quickly. So if you could do that, that will be closing soon. We'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, and then also just ways to get connected with XR Access. Um, sorry, let me just share my screen again. There we go. I'll type a few of these links yes. in chat. Thank you. I had some, up, but perfect. Yes. If you'd like to get more involved, which we would love for you to, you can join our Slack. Um, that link will be posted and it's also on the screen. If you'd like to become a member, you can go to this link. And if you want to follow us on Twitter, it's at XR Access. And if you have any questions, so the email address is info at xraccess.org. And if you're interested specifically in an institutional membership, you can contact Jesse Taft, and that's at jgt43 at cornell.edu. Thank you very much, Dylan, for posting those. Certainly. And I think uh, we also have, uh, we did make some, some XR Access emails. You can also just email jesse at xraccess.org. A little easier to remember. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. I think we can conclude.
Thanks very much. Great talk.